And we are live. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Corey. I am with Roman's Bookstore. And uh, tonight we are going to be doing um, what's called Local Authors Night or Day. <clears throat> we have Jared Seig and Jose Recio with us. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to let you all know if you have yet to purchase the books, um, you can do so with using this little purchase books green button down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, also, tonight we have room for Q&A from the audience, and so please put your questions also bottom of the screen. It says ask a question tab. Put your questions in that tab, please, so we can get to all of them. Okay, I'm going to introduce our guests. Jared Side is the executive director of Center for Council. He has designed, piloted, and coordinated council-based programs in prisons, assisted living facilities, youth groups, and a variety of nonprofit, faith-based faith -based organizations, social service, and law enforcement agencies. That's a mouthful. Let's see. He has coordinated, mentored, and facilitated um, council programs at over a dozen schools in Southern California. And he has led trainings and retreats focusing on reconciliation and community building all over the world. Jared is the author of Where Compassion Begins, Foundational Practices and Enhanced Mindfulness, Attention and Listening from the Heart. It's a book that draws from the extraordinary contributions of many teachers, mentors, and allies who have contributed to the evolution of the work of Center for Council. Jose El Recio was born and raised in Spain, where he studied medicine. As a physician, he later left for California <clears throat> on an international fellowship. He and his wife are currently living in Pasadena. While in practice, he published several papers in medical journals. Over the last few years, though, he has now <clears throat> gone to the creative writing side. <clears throat> uh, tonight, he's going to be going over his book called Transitions. It's a collection of beautifully written short stories. Um, they are both written in Spanish and in English. So first, we're going to have Jared. And then we'll listen from Jose. Thank you, Corey. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you to uh, Vromans. And I want to express my gratitude to all of you for being here. It's an uh, enormous privilege and um, a blessing. Thank you for your time. You don't have to be here. You could be any number of places. Uh, so I want to acknowledge um, the gift of your presence um, and all who make it possible for us to enjoy the great privilege of being able to sit back and log on with Wi-Fi to kind of consider um, other stories of being human. So thank you to everybody who made it possible to be here and all the, the folks who have come before um, that have supported us and seen us and listened to us and loved us. Thank you to you for being here. I'm going to start with a poem because I think it might frame what this is all about and then I'll get going. But I, I wanted to share with you something from Mirabai Bush. You may know Mirabai Bush. She was kind enough to allow me to use at the beginning of this book, a poem of hers called Why Listening is the Most Radical Act. I think it's kind of fitting to start there. We need to listen fully. It's the basis of all compassionate action. We need to listen not only to the voice of the person who is hurting, but to her bare feet the baby wrapped in her shawl, and the stars in the cold night. Such full listening helps us hear who is calling and what we can do in response. When we listen for the truth of the moment, we know better what to do and what not to do, when to act and when not to act. We hear that we're all here together and we are all we've got. The promise of listening from the heart. It's an extraordinarily um, healing act that has incredible uh, potential to, to nourish, I think, our society at its very core. Um, I'm so excited to tell you about my work 
the nature of the practice of counsel, um, how it informs the programs that we do in the world and, and how this book came to be, what it's all about. And hopefully I'll get to bring in some of the voices of folks who have been part of um, really uh, embodying the power of listening in all kinds of settings that may surprise you. Um, yes, uh, my name is uh, Jared Side. Um, I'm executive director of this organization. Center for Counsel is a nonprofit organization based in Los Angeles um, that delivers programs and trainings that promote communication, enhance well-being, that build community, and that foster compassion. And we work in a variety of places, bringing these practices uh, to teachers and kids in schools, to the staff of community-based organizations, um, to uh, doctors and nurses in hospitals, to business leaders, um, people in prison, incarcerated in jails and prisons, and to police officers and other law enforcement officers. Um, so hopefully I'll get a chance to share with you a little bit of all that. Um, as we practice it, counsel is really just coming together in a good way to offer regard, kind of as we're doing here, to listen without judgment, to speak authentically. Um, the word counsel comes from the Latin word concilium, actually used by none other than Benjamin Franklin back in the day when he was first here in this country, observing the indigenous folks who were here. He was invited to the uh, Haudenosaunee practice of talking circle, and he got to watch what it meant to come together and used the word council. It's a gathering of people. And uh, so that word didn't come close to describing what was happening, but it really was what framed all of these practices. Um, the way we practice it um, currently was developed at a place called the Ojai Foundation in the 1970s and 80s. Um, this foundation was a host to a succession of extraordinary teachers, really brilliant and generous wisdom keepers and medicine people and folks from around the world um, who celebrated and shared traditions of dialogic practices, both indigenous practices um, like the uh, talking circles of the Haudenosaunee, um, also practices from Africa like Fumble Talk and Dare and Ibiduramo from Rwanda, practices like uh, Ho'oponopono from Hawaii, Polynesian cultures, Diwan and Loya Jurga from Islamic traditions, Ma'agal Hakshava, the Hebrew tradition of listening circle. Um, the Quakers practiced a version of this in the civil rights era. Um, these were all celebrated and studied and honored uh, and referenced in the evolution of this practice of counsel, which was something that seem to have the potential to really be healing in this time. So what is it? What is it? Council is essentially five simple elements. Um, they are basically that we come together in a circle so we can see who's there. A circle that gives us a chance to see who is present and to make ourselves um, present in a way that allows us to offer regard to one another. Obviously, in person, it's a lot easier than online, but we found ways to do it, even with things like Zoom. The second element is that there's a center in every council, and the center holds a kind of a common purpose or a common ground, something that's precious. We actually enact putting that which is important into the center, and that may be something that is symbolic, a picture or an item. It might be the product that our company produces. It might be a stethoscope or a reflex hammer if we're a bunch of uh, doctors that are meeting together. And it could just be remembering uh, someone or something that's heavy on our heart. We might make a dedication and honor somebody as part of that center of the circle. The next element is that we need to step in. We need to actually move into the circle consensually. Nobody stumbles in or comes in casually. It's got to be something that we do deliberately. In council, there are four intentions. And the intentions really make up the crux of counsel. When we enter this space, we agree to say what is alive. We speak from the heart. We speak what is true and real in the moment. And that's sometimes different than what we plan to say or think we should say or have rehearsed saying or have always said. We speak what is uh, there in the moment spontaneously rather than taking the time to rehearse and plan and to go to the essence, to be lean. The, the last intention in council is to listen in a way that sets aside our tendency to analyze and judge and have an opinion and decide if we agree or disagree, but just to listen to understand. This kind of listening from the heart is sort of the critical piece. And it's something that we're so used to doing, you know, out in nature when we're at the beach and we hear the waves, we don't have to agree or disagree with the waves. We learn about the surf by listening, you know, same with 
you know, listening to the, to the wind in the trees, we don't have to have a stance. We can listen to understand, but somehow when it comes to listening to people, yeah, we don't do that too well. We don't really allow ourselves the chance to open and to really hear each other without having an opinion. Um, are you with me or are you against me? Do I agree or disagree? And finally, in council, we need to close the council. We need a, a way to step away from this way of being together and to understand that this is important and precious time, that um, maybe we want to um, keep this confidential. Maybe we want to determine this is a space we can come back to to speak in this way with each other. And that's really about it. I, I was called to this practice of council um, when it was something that felt like a way to uh, nourish a school that my daughter was in. My daughter was very young around the time of the Rodney King riots in LA. Um, it was after the verdicts came out and the school was falling apart as many public schools were. We felt like we needed something that could bring the school back together. And we reached out for this practice of council. It came into the school. It was practiced by parents and then teachers and then kids. And it was extraordinary how in a matter of about six months, the school really shifted from a place that was so acrimonious and defensive and guarded to a place of care where we really were able to put what was important at the very center. Uh, and I just fell in love with it. it. It seemed like the thing that I really needed to move towards and I learned how to do it. And I went up to this Ojai Foundation and I eventually became the director of the Center for Council Training up there. Um, we outgrew that place and realized that the work we were doing needed to be something that could be of value in a lot of places that weren't off the grid in Ojai. As we really look around in our lives, we see so much suffering. And, and as we bear witness to the human cost of poverty, of mass incarceration, the tragedy of systemic racism, the inequities and the injustice of the of the criminal justice system, the education system, the healthcare system. There are so many ways in which we are aware of suffering and the voices and the stories are often silenced. Council seemed like a place we could really be of service. And so we began to bring this practice, not just into a school, but into the world. And uh, one of the places that seemed so uh, important for me was in prisons. And so we looked around and at the time, prisons were incredibly overcrowded. You may remember this time in California where prisons that were built for 120,000 folks had 200,000 plus in them. They were places of um, tremendous suffering and misery. One of the worst was a place called Salinas Valley State Prison. Um, it was falling apart, but there was a warden there that was very forward-looking, and he invited us to come and share this practice of counsel. Um, it was an extraordinary thing that happened after this first group. I'm going to share with you a video right now, and I'm going to bring in the voices from 2013 of this very first council group. It'll give you a taste of what it looks like, and then maybe I'll be able to tell you a little bit more about what happened when we began to move forward with it. Let's see if I can make this work. To dedicate this to the families of my victims. You know, they might hate me. I wish really bad things. But I wish they would know that I can change. I'm not that man anymore. I lost somebody close to me not too long ago and the best thing for me to do to do was be with my brothers because if I wasn't able to be around them there would have been a victim that I would have took their life to fill that void of what was taken from me and the way I deal with that now on a daily basis is to keep myself around positive people, not be around negativity, come to groups like this, and to always remember her in my heart. Every day I'm gonna have to live with the fact that not only the life that I took, I took my life from my children, my wife, my mother, my father, these are actions I have to live with forever. So in a way, I'm glad I'm here. Thankful even at times. Because I have brothers here, new brothers, that I know I can lean on now. I always thought I did what I did because it was me or him, you know I mean, at the time. But now that I have grown in a spiritual way, 
I'm trying to work on those things now. I'm trying to like not get mad at myself, not put myself down. I'm trying to forgive myself. I never, I have never asked my mom to forgive me. And when you said that, it made me think about, I need to go ask my mom for forgiveness because I'm her baby. And she's always been in my corner, always driving up to Pelican Bay. You know what I mean? That that takes a lot. And uh, yeah, I'm, ne I'm never yet to ask her. So I'm gonna make sure that uh, tomorrow I ask her for forgiveness. And uh, I wanna thank you for that work. There's um, an extraordinary, um, consistent experience to sit in these circles, circle after circle, and bear witness to the courage and vulnerability and truth telling and transformation um, that happens. The rehabilitation process requires stepping away from everything you think you know about yourself, that you've been taught to believe about yourself. And folks find tools, they find practices, they find skillful means um, to really attend to what's up for them in these councils. They learn to be vulnerable. They learn to uh, open their hearts, imagine who it is they want to become, and they do it uh, supported by each other. It's a really extraordinary thing to see the first program in this very difficult prison, this very violent prison, was so successful that after um, two weeks, the waiting list for two open seats had grown to 250 uh, folks on the prison yards. Um, CDCR, uh, the, the Department of Corrections heard about it, and it led to some more grants. It led to our ability to increase to a couple more prisons. We're now in 27 prisons. There are uh, four, about 4,500 uh, folks who are participating in prisons along with their families. The incredible success they've had, the success of the program, the success that we have been able to see in the grants of parole has been really stunning. Folks are starting their lives. They're resetting their lives, um, learning trades, coming back into the community with a new sense of who it is they um, want to be in the next chapter of their lives. And some of them are working for us now in LA, former lifers. It's amazing. And council looks different everywhere that it lands, right? Council doesn't look like this in other places. But when we go into prisons, we need to talk about what is this doing? And so we use metrics of uh, criminogenic factors. When you think about criminality, there are things like impulse control and empathy and antisocial and social, pro-social behavior and outlook. Um, and we measure these things in prisons. But when we are working with healthcare professionals, obviously we don't talk about criminogenic factors. Um, we talk about burnout, physician burnout and dealing with secondary trauma and mitigating depersonalization when you have patients, you know, you have the broken leg in room three and the child with a brain tumor in room 10, and you begin to lose the humanity uh, of the folks you're dealing with uh, at your peril. There's something very different about working with doctors and nurses as there is working in schools with kids on curriculum issues of self, you know, text to self connections, you know, the, the way we understand the work we're doing, reading and writing is nothing if not listening and speaking, listening attentively and speaking authentically. And so there are ways to speak of this in schools as well as community-based organizations where we work with staff that is often so burned out, so overwhelmed by the work they do with so little resource. But the, the thing I wanna just bring up um, as we kind of move along is law enforcement is an incredible area to do this practice as well. You might not think it seeing what you just saw, but the landscape of suffering that the police function within enormous amount of human tragedy can be overwhelming. Um, how to identify that dysregulation that police officers feel, the sympathetic arousal that puts them in a state that is really unmanageable and the maladaptive behavior that they then go to to mitigate that state with drinking and, and violence and hypersexuality, et cetera. We talk about health and wellness and discernment and de-escalation when we talk to police. And they are now working on this. We have seven cohorts of 25 officers, each in LAPD, that are learning this work, that are learning about compassion, sitting in council huddles, and practicing creating a relationship with themselves and their team and the community in that order. Uh, it really begins with getting real about how we're doing, having an opportunity to sit down and really look at what it is that's coming up in the work that we do and creating a capacity to be with our own vulnerability. It's a hard thing for some folks to do, but once you do it, you begin to see how nourishing it is. And then you start to ask, okay, I can do it here, but who's not here? Who's not in my circle? There are some people who can't be here. And what do I, 
what will I do about that? What is beyond this sense of my club and their club, this us and them? What's beyond us and them? I'm glad you asked that question. I'm going to bring one other um, clip in here. This is the work we're doing now that weaves the activists, the formerly incarcerated, the police together in this practice of counsel, in this practice that really uh, fosters compassion. Let's see if I can pull that other clip to, for you. And then that will be the last one we do here. How about this one? I don't think I've ever been uh, in a room with cops without having a feeling of the need to try to run. Right? <laughs> I don't feel like I have to run. I haven't had that since I've been home. Taking someone's freedom away. It's a very real serious thing to put someone in handcuffs and take them to jail. It's a huge responsibility. And in this community, it can represent oppression, the history of conflict that we've had. <laughs> and we named it the rabbit basil. But it was only basil for like two days, so I started calling it bun buns, which is so stupid. And everyone calls the rabbit bun buns now, and it got huge. <laughs> and so just knowing that there is an officer that has a bunny named Bun Bun. <laughs> like, I wish that the uniform could also convey those beautiful little sparks of our humanity. When Jared was talking about it in, in prison, about what was going on with the LAPD and, and uh, just what Center for Counsel was doing with law enforcement and uh, even the idea of bringing, you know, counsel and having it with inmates and COs, I mean, that, it was like, wow, like I, I actually see it happening. It's about the counsel. It's about opening up and being open and aware of new things because you never know how the person's story is your story. It's amazing to hear the, the similarities. If we open our hearts and minds, we probably will learn so many amazing things about how we can support each other and make the world better. This uh, clip is um, a little trail. Oh my, sorry about that. The um, clip is a little trailer for a documentary we did called Cops and Communities Circling Up. Uh, it really begins to show what happens when we can practice compassion and weave in this way. I got a little under five minutes and I wanna wrap up. There's so much more to talk about, but I'm gonna read this piece. This is a, um, another piece from the book. It's a poem by Rumi that you may be familiar with. It's a beautiful poem called The Great Wagon. Uh, translated by Coleman Barks, there's a couple of lines that I just need to read here. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there's a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. So... Can we get to that field? What does that field look like? What does it mean to think about beloved community? My thesis and that of the book um, is that counsel and mindfulness encourages us to deepen our listening. And deeper listening builds understanding and empathy and empathy primes compassion and compassion primes relationality. And good relationships lead to cooperation and cohesion and cooperative and cohesive communities flourish. I think in this time where social media, all media really is kind of working on us to contract, you know, to have us kind of fear and disdain people we disagree with and things we don't understand rather than being open, we tend to think less of and, and um, hold the other side as unworthy or unlikable, unlovable. It can lead to dangerous places. It can lead to all kinds of disharmony and even violence and worse as we've seen. And I think it's a critical time for us to think about how we make a shift, how we practice down-regulating, how we can open our hearts and, and listen more deeply to find that common ground, to find that field beyond right-doing and wrong-doing. I think it's a 
a necessary moment in time. Uh, we can do it in person, but we can also do it online. We can also do it, um, we found through correspondence. We had a time during the pandemic where this was all based on letters being sent to and from prisons. And that was an amazing experience where folks would sit in their cells and write letters and we'd send back um, you know, instructions and then accumulate the shares of 20 or 25 folks from a group in a prison and send them back as a round of counsel. Um, online, we have social connection councils that were really popular. We found a way to do it at the beginning of the pandemic. They're not quite filled as they have been with waiting lists. Now you can get into them and I would encourage anybody who's interested to check us out, go to the website. And if you'd like, come to a council and sit down for 90 minutes with folks from around the world. I think we have to begin, we have to find some way for understanding and moving towards this ability to open our hearts and listen uh, so that we can foster an environment where compassion can arise. I'm gonna end with just this little piece from the back of the book, if you're interested, because I, I think an understanding is where it begins. Compassion is sometimes confused with empathy or even sympathy. It is neither, though it includes some aspects of both. Compassion begins when we allow ourselves to really hear and attune to suffering that of others as well as ourselves. And hearing and perceiving this anguish, we're moved to do something about it. What takes compassion beyond sympathy or empathy is that it includes action, action that is considered skillful and beneficial. Counsel is a foundational practice that builds our capacity to perceive the experience of others and invites us to pay attention. When we are mindful and listen differently to someone's story without judging, we create the conditions for compassion to arise. This book is an invitation to build the muscle of compassion through exercises and practices that enhance our capacity to listen from the heart and in doing so, take care of ourselves and those around us. So uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for this whirlwind tour on the work we do. If you're interested, check out the website or if you have any questions, we'll have some time later. And thank you, Corey, for hosting us. Thank you, Jared, so much. Um, okay, um, I think we're just going to go right in with Jose. So I'm going to bring him in. Thank you, Jose. Hi, Jose. Okay, Jared, we're going to talk around. Okay, you ready, Jose? Yeah. It's all you. you. Okay. Well, um, thank you, Jared, for this impressive uh, presentation. Uh, I myself have worked at the, in prisons uh, throughout my career as a practice uh, psychiatrist and physician. And I know it's a very tough, very tough uh, job re requires a, a lot of skills. Thank you also, Romans, for giving us uh, this opportunity and thank you the staff who put together this meeting so that uh, we can have the opportunity to present our work and hopefully it's for some help. My book is a, it's a book of fiction. I'm gonna see if we can see. It's called Transitions and it's a collection of 24 bilingual stories. So what I did is to write a story in English. And once the story was published, I translated into Spanish, which is my uh, native language. And some people may ask, well, why, why did you do that? Why don't uh, you write in Spanish, which is your native language, and then translate in English? Well, there is a reason or more than one reason for it. But I will, I'll address this point uh, later on in the, in the meeting. Now, the 24 uh, stories, as I say, bilingual, what I read in the Amazon, on Amazon, or on the uh, publisher, the co commentaries of the readers, is that it is helpful. Uh, it helps with those who are in the process of learning uh, Spanish and uh, those who are in the process of learning English. The stories are very different one from the other. They are, they, they take place in a different uh, country, 
the characters are of different type, the conflicts or plots that they have to deal with are different and so forth. And uh, there are two groups. One group of stories is what I call short, short stories, which is between one page and three pages, more or less. And the others are longer stories of about uh, anywhere between four and uh, 23 pages, the longest one I found them. Now, the short stories are of the, out of the 24 at seven. So I said 30% of my stories are very short in this book. And the other 17 or 70% 70, uh, 70 are much longer. Do they have anything in common? As I said, every, every, each story is different. However, we can make two groups out of these 24. One group is based on my personal experience as well as professional experience. At the end, I practiced medicine for many years and uh, it's inevitable, You it's part of you, so you have something to say, but what I have to say is fiction. It's not reality. My experience were not those of the characters. And uh, my professional experience is, is, is also fiction. However, both, in both cases, I create situations, conflicts, which uh, in which the, per, the characters dealing with these conflicts or these situations uh, likely are going to have very similar uh, thoughts or experience or behaviors as I had during the time when I was living my life in other situations. This is nothing new. Many, many writers do that, do um, um, use autobiographic experiences, if you wish, to create fictional uh, characters. So those, is, those stories who are based on either my personal or professional experience make up about 60% of the total. And the other 40% are based on pure imagination. That is, these are stories of fantasy. But in any case, with, with the exception of about two or three, maybe three uh, stories which are completely uh, fantasy, the others have all a background of what they call mainstream fiction. What is mainstream fiction? What is the term that they are used in the academic and the literary circles to indicate that what is happening in the story is easily recognized by the readers because it is, uh, in fact, uh, uh, characters who could be anybody than we, than we know. That's what it means. It's, it's the form of writing of many classic uh, short story writers like Chekhov, Guy de Maupassant, um, uh, um, Carver, Raymond Carver, you name them. Many of them have used autobiographic uh, experiences, but in a completely uh, fictional way. Uh, and sometimes uh, we want to, as readers, we want to know how, how a writer uh, invented a story, a writer of fiction, I mean, how invented a story, how the story came about. And I think it's an interesting question. And so I'm going to say something about that. And in order to do that, I'm going to help myself, if I can, if I know how to do this, with a slideshow. Let me try this and see if I can, if we can share this, this screen. And you, you will tell me. If, uh, okay. I, I believe that this is successful, and uh, you probably can see on the screen the title of the story I'm referring to, which of course is one of the stories in my book. And it happens to be the first story that, um, that I wrote, and I published uh, in uh, 2015. That was the first, the first story. The book is published in, 
uh, at the very beginning of this year, I think it was in February or March. All right, El Soto Village is a story that is placed in Guatemala, the country of Guatemala that I have visited several times, of course. Uh, the way this story came about in my mind is as far as it follows. This is a picture of the city of Antigua in Guatemala, where I usually stay when I go and visit the country. It's a panoramic view, as you can see, of part of the city. The city in itself is very interesting because it was one of the first cities I founded after Columbus. And uh, uh, it was the capital of that country of Guatemala. It had a different name at that time. Uh, but the city was destroyed more than once by the uh, volcanoes, volcanoes that are around the city, in the mountains surrounding this city. But the people liked the city and they reconstructed and stay, uh, and again said this is the capital and so forth until one time when they said no more and that is not the capital anymore and call it Antigua, which is a, a word in Spanish function as an adjective to indicate former or old. The people in Guatemala, or, or the country itself, was the, the cradle, actually, of the, of the Mayan civilization, as you know. And uh, together with the Yucatan in Mexico and, uh, and parts of the Ch Chiapas, the state of Chiapas. Anyway, the people are still today the, 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 the country is populated by a, a huge number of, uh, of uh, directly descendants from the Mayas. And they have their own traditions, their own ways of dressing, their own ways of dealing with things, and their own spirituality, which is a mixture of the Catholic, Christian Catholic, and the pagan. Here, for example, you see uh, residue of the old, older uh, Antigua city, which was, which was the, before when it was still a capital of the Guatemala, is a church. Now, what is interesting, and these people are very religious in, in general, and here is a picture in which they are attending mass. You don't see the church because it's dark, but it's all uh, it's packed, and so the people stay stands outside of the church. I mingle with all these people also, I mean, some some of these people. And the story came about when I began to listen to them and their, 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 what they had to say about the civil war and the six that took place in Guatemala for many years, uh, starting in the 60s and ended in 1996. So I became interested myself about those, those stories and I began to meet with, with individuals. Let's see what is the next one. Uh, sitting on a bench in, in a park. And as you can see, here is me and the other man is a local and he's telling me about uh, the story of the war and his experiences. And so I took plenty of notes. I'm used to take notes because going to medical school before the computer, you have to take a lot of notes. And from there, I, I, went, I went traveling where the focus of the war has been the most intense. And I traveled by bus because there is nothing like traveling by public transportation to get to know the country and the people in the country. And so I met a number of people there, such as this woman with the baby and the ways and traditions that they have to dress. She's buying an ice cream from a vendor, which is not seen in the picture. And, and uh, other similar people that, that interest me, highly interested in, in their lives and the, the way they, they did. And so, I'm passing this quickly to it. And this one is a, is a shop. This woman, in fact, herself a writer, um, uh, has a traditional way of uh, dressing uh, the Mayan. And in, in her shop, she uh, sells this uh, 
um, ba uh, I don't know, bags and, and other blankets and uh, sweaters and so forth. They all are, are local products. They do this. They are weavers, good weavers. The way she dresses, uh, the upper part of the of the dress is uh, what they call weepil. And in English, I think was, we, we should say uh, weepil. And the skirt, they call it nagua. Okay. When I heard all these stories and I went to the library and read the books and uh, listened to other people, uh, uh, etc., I decided to write a story. And I'm going to read, if I can take this, this thing here, or maybe Curry can take this out of this. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll read the beginning, the opening of this story that I've been, uh, been talking about and showing the pictures. It says like this. Father Lionel Guzman had been the parish priest of uh, Cruz Santa Church for 37 years and was feeling too old to keep pace with the demands of his ministry. His hair had turned gray and his muscles often ached, but his life as a rural priest helped him to stay slim. He was a Ladino, a descendant of the colonial Europeans, taller than the average man in town. Rarely did he wear a cassock outside of religious services, but he never failed to wear a large crucifix on a thin chain. A couple of years ago, on a night of thunder and rain, someone knocked violently on his door. It was after midnight. Father Guzman, a female voice called. He put his pants and shirt over his pajamas. Who's there? It's Irma. My husband, Ulil, went to the woods at sundown to gather pine straws. He isn't back. I have a bad feeling. Please help me. Irma had married Ulil for months, uh, four months earlier, and they were expecting their first baby. He opened the door. Irma, a young, handsome Mayan woman, was wearing a dark reddish whipple and nagua, and had covered her shoulders with a small green blanket. She looked apprehensive and was soaked. Please help me. He wasn't sure if this was a dream. Let me put my boots on and grab a couple of lanterns, he said. They walked hastily in silence, side by side, near the mountain slope, holding their breath and their lanterns. She knew the area well because she had accompanied her, accompanied her husband many times to collect pine straws. They were basket weavers. She called out her husband's name. Father Goodman called it too, but they heard no response, only the sounds of the wind and rain beating against the leaves of the trees. Suddenly, the priest stumbled over a large blackened lamp surrounded by bundles of pine ropes, probably a charred trunk of a tree, he thought. But Irma had, had fainted beside him, and when he saw it was Uli's dead body, he knew that lightning had struck him. It took several weeks for Father Goodman to recover from that shock. Gradually, though, he went back to his mission to his mission of gaining terrain over the Protestants in favor of Catholics. The evangelist had already built a church, and this was killing him. So, at the beginning of 1991, he maintained his enthusiasm for the mission. To complicate matters, an armed, an armed, an armed conflict 
between the military forces of the Guatemalan government and civilian guerrilla groups was going on in different parts of the country, including the highlands, cradle of the Mayan, of the Mayan civilization. Although the actual fight had not reached El Teso village, an atmosphere of stress prevailed as news about the atrocities committed not from, from there filtered in. All right, so this is the opening of this story. And uh, the other stories, as I said, have a completely different uh, setting and uh, circumstances. But going back to the beginning of uh, what I was said about um, all, of, all of the stories being bilingual and why didn't I write in Spanish first and then in English, the answer I think uh, I think is in the, my preface, the preface of my book. Let me see very quickly, and I, I'll read it to you because it, it answered that. I said, if one if one is born and raised in a country and then moves to another, an appropriate adaptation requires not only that one acquires the new language, but also integrates the two cultures. From a pragmatic from a pragmatic point of view, however, popular culture, including language, dominates the daily social activity of a country. The acknowledgement of this reality, along with encouragement from my American wife, determined that I switch languages and write in English. And that's, that's the reason why I did it. And there is no question in my mind that when it comes to literature or creative writing, people have different, there, there are diff people with different tastes, some of them, so some of us like uh, to read short stories, Others like to read novels, others like to read non-fiction people, I mean, non-fiction non, uh, uh, non -fiction or not, uh, just more like a non-fiction uh, creative writing, like the book of uh, Jared's book, and so forth. So for those of you who like to read uh, short stories, it may be worth to spend uh, the money for my book. Hope you like it. Thank you very much. Hi. Thank you Hi. so much, Jose. That was wonderful. Thank you. Beautiful writing. Thank you for sharing your story. I um there's a couple of uh questions from the audience. I'm going to ask them. I'm going to toggle my video out while you guys answer, if you don't mind. So the first question is for Jared. Um, and someone's wondering about marital and family counsel. Um, yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for asking that. And thank you, Jose, so much for that. It was really transporting. I so appreciate the opportunity to travel with you. Um, this is the incredible promise of sharing our stories is this intimate kind of uh, communion, this opportunity to journey with somebody into a place that has a, a, a kind of a special meaning. I think that um, the practice of counsel is a practice of listening to the stories. There is nothing more impactful in an intimate relationship and a family than opening up the opportunity to speak authentically and to really feel heard. So my, I have been blown away, not only by what I have experienced with folks who have learned the practice of counsel and then have either brought it home with them after a training or have, you know, at a, a visiting day at a prison decided to bring their, their families into a circle and actually listen to the children, listen to the partner, tell the authentic story. It is an extraordinary opportunity to connect on a deeper level and to really invite uh, that which is so precious about the relationships that we create in our lives like families and intimate partnerships. I also in my own life have found it to be the um, most surprising and extraordinary um, pathway to intimacy. So I would say that counsel uh, between partners, 
counsel within a family, even counsel between yourself and your, your four-legged friend or out in nature um, enables us to really open to a kind of a presence with those things that surround us in our world that are meaningful but often don't receive the regard and often we don't let um, touch us deeply. Um, I, I strongly recommend it. Uh, anybody who's interested in learning the practice, I would uh, invite you to come check out the website, come to a training, come to an online council and uh, get a sense of what it is to practice in this way and take it home to your partner and take it into your family. Um, I'll just say one last thing. I I, uh, I was surprised, you know, I, I said we've been training the LAPD, really tough, brawny kind of sergeant guy was sort of like working with his practice of counsel. He came in on, a, on the second day of a two-day training and said, you know, I, I went home and I, I was thinking that maybe I could do this counsel with my kids. And I, I thought, you know, why don't I ask them to tell a story of uh, a popsicle, a dreamsicle, and a poopsicle, the little kids. And the popsicle was the thing they really enjoyed. And the dreamsicle was the thing they were hoping for. And, and the poopsicle, which they loved saying, because kids love saying the word poop, was the thing that they really hated about the day. And he was able to kind of create this storytelling circle in his little family by doing this practice. And I was amazed by it. Um, highly recommend exploring this practice inside a family and inside a relationship. It is truly transformational. Wow, that is that's a, this is amazing work that you do. Thank you. Um, um, th this question is for Jose. Um, what has inspired you to start writing fiction? Sorry, what 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 took me to write? The question fiction? was, yeah, what has inspired you to start writing fiction? When did I uh, start writing fiction? Yeah. Yeah. What inspired that? What inspired you to oh, go what from writing? Oh, what inspired me? Okay. Like, um, it's a very good question. In fact, I just finished writing a personal essay that is, that of course, uh, 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 is not published. About that, uh, and I, I, uh, the title of this personal essay that I just finished writing is uh, uh, writing, uh, writing Experiences at 70. It's a very it's a very interesting thing because it has to do with one what everything that one has done before, and what I have been doing before is is a number of many things. Obviously, some of them completely different, like playing soccer, for example, and uh, dancing, for example, and uh, working in a in a in, in research and practicing medicine and, uh, and, and so forth. So when I retired, and I must say I had to retire because I got acutely sick and I couldn't keep on working and then I recovered afterwards, uh, I started looking for a, something to do that it would be as creative as what I have done before. and. Uh, during the writing of the essay, I found out that the activities I had been deeply involved or wholeheartedly involved were very different, but they had one thing in common. And what they had the thing in common is my taste for the aesthetics. And so when I played soccer, it was important to me or the, the field that was fulfilling for me is when I was part of a beautiful game or a gorgeous uh, play. When I was dancing, social dancing, I mean, uh, what it was interesting and fulfilling was that aesthetic uh, uh, pleasure of the movement of the dance and the steps of dancing. When I was in the working in the lab in research in neuro in, in, in neuroscience, what really uh, helped me and uh, gave me pleasure was the enlightenment, the learning by by myself, and I learned how to do things without many teachers. So I'm one of those who believe in self-taught or self-teaching, and so I say, well. Do I know how to paint? No. 
Do I know how to play how to play piano? No. What do I know? Oh, wait a second. What I know is to write because that's what I've been doing all of my life. So from there to understand that uh, writing science requires a language, a type of language, scientific language, which I, I knew very well. But writing, um, uh, be creative, and that's what I think, that's what I'm, the point I'm trying to do, uh, requires uh, write literature in a way that is uh, aesthetic, or, the, or triggers the taste for the aesthetic. And so writing was the only tool that I had available. And to answer your question, that's why I, I started writing. But I, uh, it was a challenge because in the writing world, what you use is, is the vernacular language and the colloquial language. And so I had to do a lot of work to, to, see, to master uh, uh, that part of my, my training. That is incredible. Um, there's a a, diff, a second part to that story or to that question is I. Well, you sort of answered it. It was is how difficult is it for you to go to transition from the medical journaling to, to the fiction and and, and what kind of steps did it take to go into the fiction area of your writing? Well, fascinating how. Keen, this, uh, these questions are to the point very well. Uh, this question is very much to the heart of, as I say, of the, of the issue here. The transition was very difficult. Um, why? Because I had to done uh, for many years practicing a profession. Your brain is trained to keep on doing the same thing. You don't really think about any other thing at the beginning. So it took me, to be accurate, two years. During those two years, I was recovering for what I say, what I had. And uh, I was looking for a part-time job in Spain because uh, after I retired, my wife and I decided to move to Spain for a while and we were there for four years. And during, during that time, I was searching and uh, and, um, and I got a job, but, but then we decided that that was going to take me to the same the same place where I left uh, with the stress and the sickness. So um, as I as I moved away from that idea, the it came another idea into my mind, which was to become a translator. Uh, science, uh, for medical translator. So I, I went to school and I finished a master in translation. And uh, when I finished the master in translation, then I find out that that was not what I what I was looking for. That that was not fulfilling. And it's very important that what you do is, is give you a fulfillment. Very important in any any aspect of life. So I say, what well, the heck? This is not fulfilling. What I want is to is, is to write, just write a story or whatever. And so it took me about two years, and then the study, and which is very welcome because uh, I'm above all, I'm, I have a little bit of a student in me. So I was I was glad to to study that, uh, and then I said, no, I think. The only tool I have is the, the, the pen, and that's what I'm going to do. And that's what I'm doing. Thank you. OK. I hope I did. Did I cut you off? No, no, it's fine. OK. Um, Jared, this question is also for you, like, in a sense of, um, being in the council and, and working with um, the people you work with and, and the families and stuff, do you ever bring in the writings that you guys, you said these were letters, did, did they ever, do they ever come to surface in your meetings? And or do you ever have 
anyone bring in writing or do writing as part of your council? It's extraordinary for folks to find to find their voice, to find the ability to be the author, to be the authority, to be the teller of the story of your life. And I think um, we have an opportunity to be with what is emergent when we're together and we can uh, nourish each other with just the regard of really caring enough to sit through a circle, to really bring our full attention and listening. It gives permission for us to um, take the time to find that authentic story that we have, for whatever reason, decided to kind of keep under the surface. So what it unleashes in individuals is extraordinary. Um, the things that folks are intended to do in council are really spontaneous, but what they take with them into the world is an ability and a confidence and a resolve to really articulate kind of their next um, their, ne their next chapter, the next version of themselves. So there's an enormous amount that is prompted by the council circles where folks go off. And certainly the work in schools, the work in prisons and uh, other sort of areas that uh, encourage sort of a contemplative practice have led to some beautiful writing. And frankly, during the pandemic, it was an amazing thing to see a barrage of letters come at us of folks saying, I have a story to tell, but I have no one to tell it to. Can we start our council again through the mail? And so by encouraging folks to sit down to make a special space, maybe a sacred space where they can actually kind of drop into that still small voice inside and allow themselves to just write freely, we were able to amass incredible rounds of counsel that we compiled into these newsletters. There are hundreds of them. It led to writing the book and it led to the invitation for folks to find um, a way to kind of take a backward step and settle into um, the permission to really be yourself, to find your authentic voice. So writing and uh, speaking in council are very connected. Um, compassion is something that we do. It's not something that we think about or feel. We have to, we have to actually enact it. And sometimes when you find somebody who's willing to sit with you, um, it gives you that encouragement. When there's no one there, you can find that encouragement as well to be able to access and articulate that uh, authentic story of who you are and who you're becoming. And if our work prompts that in folks, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful and thrilled. And I encourage anybody to find out about this and see how this might work in um, circumstances that serve you in your life and in your business or organization. Now, we, the audience can go to your website, centerforcouncil.org, and can get information. I'm assuming, like, if, if people want to volunteer goods or time, however, it, that information is out there on that website? We are a nonprofit, so we are completely at the whim of folks' desire to support. And when they do, it's an incredible contribution. There's always an empty chair in every council we do, whether it's in a prison or a police precinct. And the invitation is to be somebody who arrives in that chair in a circle that you may never actually sit in, but with your contribution of time, energy, you know, donations, whatever, you actually become part of circles that are really nourishing in places you can't even imagine. Go to the website. That's really, really awesome. Thank you. I have enjoyed hearing both of you speak about your experience in writing. Both, one is fiction and one is nonfiction, and they were both incredible. And, and to hear your journeys into this was just thank you so much. I really enjoyed tonight. And I think our audience did too. I we got some great comments and questions. And um, this is, we're well into the, into the hour, so I think this is a wrap, unless if either of you have anything else you'd like to add. I want to thank you. You're good. Thank you, Corey, yeah. for holding this. Thank you, Jose, for sharing your stories and for everybody for listening. It's a wonderful and, and nourishing opportunity to, to share in this way. So thank you for everybody's patience and regard. Yes, yeah, thank, and yes, thank you. I don't have anything else to say other than to repeat uh, your words. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Thank you so much for reading from your book. Um, all right, this is a wrap. I really enjoyed this, and I, I can't wait to, to finish reading your guys' books. And thank you so much for coming tonight. Thanks, so And much. thank you to our audience. You may purchase the book at any time using um, Bromansbookstore.com website. 
or you can go down to the little green button um, on this page at any time now or after the event. There is also a replay of tonight's event. We have been recorded and are on, recap, on Crowdcast with a replay. You can access the replay through uh, Roman's Bookstore website, romansbookstore.com, or through the Crowdcast. Um, just go to past events and you can watch it. You can share with your friends and family. So thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Jose and Jared. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks, Corinthia. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.